Cool. Well, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us. I guess we have a, a good number of people here on. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about cold hardy uh, cacti and succulents. So, all cacti are succulents, but not all succulents are cacti. So that's something important to remember. Uh, here's my uh, contact information. Uh, if you uh, have questions about anything uh, after today uh, or anytime during the year, whether it's about cactus or lawns or turf or anything like that. So, okay, so let's get into uh, the topic of the day. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, cactus and and succulents, mainly cactus. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I've just got a few slides on some agaves and yuccas and that type of thing, but uh, I just want to spend a lot of time on on cactus and specifically uh, winter hardy cactus. So these are things that you can grow outdoors. And in fact, they're going to be ones that are going to grow better outdoors. So these are not the the indoor ones that you, you would buy at uh, like a Lowe's or a Home Depot. These are these are outdoor winter hardy cactus. Um, I've uh, I can't even remember how many years I've had my 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 cactus garden. Probably going on oh easily 12, 13 years, maybe maybe fifteen years, something like that. So, and I got hooked on it by a golf course superintendent in Aurora, um, who turned his entire backyard into a cactus uh, garden. So, so turf people like other plants besides turf. Uh, cactus are interesting plants. We won't spend a whole lot of time on the on the botany, but there are parts of the plant that are, are important to uh, know simply from a safety perspective, because they um, they can inflict some injury or at least annoyance into your life, uh, and sometimes for quite a while. Um, so the spines that people are are usually familiar with with cactus, and those those are visibly easy to see. Uh, they look dangerous. They are often dangerous. They, they can really tear you up. Uh, but the, 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 the ones that are worse in, in my estimation are these tiny little things called glockids. And so that's how, that's how this word is, is pronounced, glockid. These are little hair-like uh, spines. And these things will get into your skin and they've got backward facing tiny, tiny little barbs. Um, so that they don't like to come out of your skin once they're in and they actually start to dig their way deeper and deeper. So they're insidious, uh, terrible little things, uh, annoying, probably at best, at worst, sometimes you might get a few little infections from these things. So, so you definitely want to be careful, uh, working with, uh, with these cacti. They, uh, some of them are, are, you can, they're very friendly and you can touch them and cuddle them if you will, but others, uh, you definitely don't want to be messing with them. Um, in the first group, I'll be talking about the Apuntias. Uh, they, they really often have a lot of uh, glockids on their, on their uh, uh, pads or stems. Um, and so that's one thing is that, uh, is that when, when we're looking at this big green thing, I like to call them pads, they're also called uh, clay dodes um, or stem joints, but these are stems, okay? These are stems. Um, and the, the, the spines are actually modified leaves on, on cactus. So just a little bit of maybe cactus trivia there for you. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really looking at the stems uh, quite often when we're, when we're looking at a cactus. So just a little important thing to remember there, uh, but that's kind of important to know also when we talk about propagating these. Okay, so here's a picture of uh, uh, my garden. Um, and you can see a lot of uh, cactus in there and for some reason a random tulip. So this picture was taken in, in uh, late spring. You can see the, the, the grass is uh, greened up already, but this is before they've started flowering. So this is uh, probably sometime in April, maybe early May. Um, uh, but uh, what what do what do these plants need in general? If you just wanted to be very brief, and you can find books and books on how to grow winter hardy cactus, I'll give you some references at the end. Uh, but by far, by far, what's going to make it easiest to grow these things is drainage. Um, now, the soil where I've got these planted isn't necessarily a, a real good draining soil. It's kind of rocky, but there's a lot of clay in it. Um, but I raise this bed up. So when I'm at ground level, all the way at the bottom of that tier, 
So here's 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 my bottom tier. But when you're standing down here, uh, you cannot see uh, above the driveway at the very top tier. So I've got a tier here. There's one, two, three, four, four levels that I have. Um, and I built these rock walls. They're just all dry rock walls. There's no concrete in there. Um, but that was the only way to get the soil to drain adequately uh, uh, to, to plant cactus in them. Um, you don't want to plant these in a low spot. Um, you want full sun. You want the driest part of your, your uh, landscape possible. Um, you don't put these on the north side of your house. Now, honey is they'll grow just about anywhere, and you can probably get them to grow there, but uh, they're not going to be real happy there. So, so drainage by far is the number one important criteria, but pretty closely followed by full sun. Um, uh, using, I encourage people to mulch, use mulch, but you don't want to use uh, organic mulch. You want to use gravel mulch, and you'll be able to see some some close-ups, but uh, you can get some pretty nice, uh, uh, attractive, colorful um, uh, gravel from our, our stone supply um, and landscape supply companies. Um, as far as water goes, uh, mine never get watered. Um, I just don't, uh, even for propagation, they don't get water um, and they, they will survive. Okay, now will, can they do a little bit better with some water? Yeah, they could. Uh, they'll spread a little bit faster if you irrigate them, maybe once a month, something like that. But, uh, and some of them will probably survive the winter a little bit better. Um, so uh, like the, the Hoyas, I'll, I'll show you pictures of Hoyas. Uh, here's one here. Uh, my, uh, my Hoyas, they, um, they winter kill at the top of the plant. They, they burn, the tops burn off every, every winter. And I could probably preve prevent that to some degree if I water those a few times during the winter. Um, but these plants in general are going to survive uh, quite well without any water. And then you 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 avoid the, the uh, possibility of overwatering, which can be a, a, a problem with some of these. And then the other thing is sanitation, just removing dead pads and weeds and, and that type of thing, uh, because that other refuse is, can be a hiding place for some insects, uh, which are uh, uh, not uncommon pest problems uh, for, for some of the cacti here. So, so you really want drainage. Um, so, you know, if you, so if you can do a sandy loam or sand, something like that. Now I would, you know, if you read books and websites, even some pretty good ones, people that are really, really, really good with these uh, plants, uh, they talk about mixing sand into clay to get it to drain better. Um, I am not a proponent of making that recommendation, mainly because people usually or rarely will will put enough sand in to improve the drainage of that soil. And what they instead do is they 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 create concrete. Um, that's how you build adobe bricks is by putting some sand into clay. Um, now, if you can get in and put like 85, 90% of the volume of your clay and turn that into 90% sand, then that will improve the drainage of that clay. Uh, but you'll see some websites, they'll say mix in 50% sand and that is not nearly enough. That's not doing anything beneficial. Um, and in fact, it's potentially causing problems. So in debt, instead, um, raise the beds up so that they drain and then avoid watering them, okay? And then you can grow in just about any kind of soil. Uh, watering again, I, I don't see a need to water these plants, but if we get a, an incredibly dry year, like we've had a few of those in the 30 plus years I've been here, you know, yeah, they could probably benefit. But usually we get enough of those occasional rains that, that you're going to get enough water on these plants to, for them to survive. Now, if you're doing these in containers, and I, I didn't, I got a few slides of, of growing uh, um uh, the cactus in, in containers, um, they, they can do well in those uh, tufa uh, uh, type containers. Um, but um, uh, those those plants, if you're growing in containers, you probably have to water once a week. So yeah, in containers, you do have to water these, but uh, growing in the ground, you really don't. As far as fertilizer goes, I've never ever fertilized mine, ever. In all the years I've had these, um, could they benefit? Maybe a little bit, but in my mind, the reason you're planting these is to have really, really minimal maintenance. So, 
uh, I I am I am a proponent of minimally maintaining these. Yeah, here's here's a close up of one of my uh, cactuses. What this is probably the, the the first the earliest blooming cactus in my garden is these little, little pedio cactus or mountain ball cactus. Cute little buggers. They're you know maybe three inches across. Um, and they, they look kind of spiny, but you can kind of touch these little guys and they really don't hurt you, but they get the greatest, coolest little flowers. Uh, these things, as you'll see later, these are hardy to like 40 below zero. These, uh, you can find these growing up nearly up to the alpine level in, uh, in the mountains. So that's where they get their name, mountain ball cactus. So they're just a little tiny ball cactus, but you can see the, uh, the, the type of gravel that I mulch with. And, and um, just like, uh, you know, so you're going to learn from uh, Allison about planting trees. It's, uh, it's better to err on the side of planting them high. It's the very same thing for cactus. You do not want to plant these things too deeply. So when you buy cactus, if you buy some, err on the, on the side of planting them a little bit above grade and then mulch around them with this um, uh, gravel to hold them in place, to kind of hold them up. So it's okay even for a little bit of roots to be showing after you've planted these, if, and especially if you have a very uh, clay soil, that, that's what can help them survive growing in clay is to plant them high and then mulch around them with gravel to kind of prop them up and hold them up. So that's a little trick for, for growing these things in a, in a, in a heavier soil. So, so gravel is the preferred mulch, not the organic stuff. So let's start talking about the, uh, different these different cacti, the different types. Uh, and I, I like starting with the prickly pear. They're by far, the, I think, the showiest ones. They're just uh, amazing in uh, the diversity of flowers, the uh, the colors of the flowers. They all kind of bloom about the same time. You'll find, you know, once you collect a bunch of them, like I do, some of them, you know, they'll be like a week before others, but in general, they all kind of bloom about the same time in late spring, early summer. And uh, you'll get a few weeks of uh, just amazing, amazing flowers. Now, some people are disappointed that the flowers don't last that long. Um, and they really don't last a real long period of time. Um, but then the plants themselves, the, 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 just the different type of, of spines, uh, the, the, the appearance of those, of those pads, uh, the fruit, that these form is it can be really cool looking so then you can get um, a display of fruit color later later in the year some of them get real bright red or others kind of purple um so you know the the attractiveness of the plants isn't just in the flowers it it can be from the uh, uh the rest of the plant as well so uh something you know if you really get into these and you start studying these so i'm showing some um, uh, some of the latin names for these so uh, polycantha um, is is one of the the real common ones but as you start reading and if you turn into a real cactus geek and i wouldn't call myself a geek i i don't get into all the uh, uh the genetics of these the genetics of the prickly pear of the apuntias is very complicated and in some some ways kind of political you have you have uh botanists and you have wings of this this these believers with the apuntias that they're this species and genus and and others of this one and the thing is is i think they're all very close related because they like interbreed like crazy so there's there's some very close genetics here but uh, you can find some very interesting heated debates about what the uh, the actual uh, uh, species name of some of these are so if you're one of those people, you can yell at me either in chat or send me emails and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. That's fine. I'm still just going to keep planting opuntias. So that's I generally just kind of refer to them as opuntias. But um, they uh, they're just they're just um, they make amazing flowers. Sometimes these flowers are almost three inches across. They're just enormous. Uh, they have tons. They produce tons and tons of pollen. So if you're a pollinator geek and um, you get all kinds of really cool um, bees and uh, native bees um, especially bumblebees um, uh, bee mimic flies 
all kinds of insects that like pollen or nectar um, will come to these um, these flowers. So that's kind of that's one of the fun parts of the of the apuntias, especially is, is is just going out and watching all the different uh, pollinators that come and visit these flowers during the day. So now don't don't uh, don't miss that part of it. The other thing is that the uh, you can kind of see here's here's one of the flower buds here. Here's another one here. Is they change in color, and sometimes you'll have multi. I've mean, got some pictures uh, coming up of, of uh, well, like this one. You'll have you'll have you, you, it looks like you have different plants growing together, but really this is one plant, and you you'll get different color flowers depending on the age of those flowers. Um, when the, when the buds open, there'll be one color, and then the next day, it, you know, it'd be kind of cool to put a time lapse on this to show how the color changes from one day to the next on these. So you get all these different shades of colors on a single plant, depending on the age of the flower after it's after it's opened up. Um, so this is just another um, uh, a species of, of prickly pear, uh, Rodantha. Um, these are these tend to be smaller flowers. Than the polyacantha ones, but uh, still, then uh, they get they get tons of flowers. So sometimes you can barely see the pads for the flowers with this one. So it's it's a very prolific flowering one. Uh, but again, the bees and the uh, the the other pollinators really love uh, uh, these as well. But very so you get some really cool colors with this uh, with this species as well. Uh, just just another example. So you can see how you go basically from a pink to a yellow flower on the same plant. That's just, that's just a really cool uh, thing with, 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 with many of these, these prickly pear, these, these apuntia species is how they change really from one day to the next. So uh, you just wanna keep going out every day um, and looking at these because your garden will change uh, during the flowering season for, for, the, uh, for the apuntias especially. Um, just another species here, uh, and uh, you get some of the bicolor ones here. So you get some, you get some of these where you get petals that have two different colors within the petals. Um, but again, these things will freely interbreed; they'll cross. So you'll get yellows crossing with reds, and you know if you're really garden geek and you want to propagate these, you can do your own crosses, and you can gather, collect seed, and and plant these things from seed. Um, I've never done that, but you can see just when you walk in nature, if you walk into do any kind of hiking or anything with uh, places where they've, there's a lot of native um, Opuntia populations, and these are native in throughout Colorado, um, uh, you'll get all kinds of different colors and you can almost see this one over here crossed with this one over here and that's kids are growing all around it and you'll see the different uh, color variations when they are blooming. So uh, very, very cool, uh, very cool thing with these, uh, these Apuntias. A lot of diversity, but then they're also very closely uh, related. Oh, here's, here's one of our, our native pollinators digging in and they are oblivious to the fact that you are there. They are so into digging way down that you, they get a lot of nectar from these, from the, from the cactus. Um, but then as they're digging down in there, they're going by all this pollen. And so then the pollen um, gets stuck on their bodies and they come crawling out of these flowers and they are just covered with pollen. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the insects that they attract are really, really very cool. Um, here's another one, uh, uh, Opuntia fragilis. Uh, and so the name the name implies it's fragile. And actually, this this thing is tough as nails. It is an absolutely you cannot kill this thing. It is the, probably the most cold hardy. You can you can probably go fifty below zero with this thing, and it's not going to kill it. So if you if you if you have a black thumb, um, you you won't be able to kill this plant uh, except maybe with water. Uh, but you can just throw this stuff. Literally, just throw it on gravel, and it will root. Um, it, it roots that easily um, and it spreads that easily. So when you're, if you're in kind of cleaning up around these things um, and you'll, you'll, something will snag on your shoe or your foot or your hand and you pull your hand, you'll pull, you almost always pull part of that plant. Um, it comes apart very, very easily. 
but then you can just like fling that thing down on the gravel um, and come back a month later and it'll be rooted in the gravel. Um, these things are, they ju they're just so ridiculously easy to, uh, to root. And again, very, very, very hardy. So it's a cool plant. It's not the showiest one with the flower. I mean, the flowers are kind of cool and it gets covered with flowers. Um, but just its growth habit, it forms this, these real low growing mats. It spreads like crazy. Um, so you have to give this one room to spread. And actually all the aponeas can get absolutely enormous. Um, when they get older, and that's if they if they escape some of the inside problems. I'll show you um, in a little while. But um, yeah, this this one is uh, like a bulletproof uh, plant. You can you can grow this one anywhere. Okay, since we're talking about the opunias, um, uh, and, and I'll come back to to Kelly here in a minute. But some of you are familiar with the name Kelly Grumman's. He's a uh, Colorado native and a, 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 a true plant geek, uh, but he's got his own website um, and it's called the, the Cactus Man. Um, although if you uh, uh, Google uh, cold hardy cactus, um, that, that uh, uh, coldhardycactus.com will also take, take you to this website. Um, but he has, and, and maybe, I don't know if you can see this, 115 different, uh, and I just took this off his website yesterday, so this is current, 115 different uh, opuntias that he is uh, selling. Um, and, you know, by far, he's got the, the largest selection he collects. He, I think, I think he does do some of his own hybridizing, um, but he's got an amazing, just incredible variety of all these different species of opuntias I just talked about. Um, just really cool pictures on his website and his prices are ridiculously low. I mean, they're, they're, um, and, and I find that to be true for, for really all the, uh, the companies, the growers of, of these winter hardy cactus. I'll show you a few others um, at, at, towards the end. Um, just very reasonably priced. So it's not expensive to get started with these. You can get fairly large plants or you can just get newly rooted ones, which are just bargain basement cheap, you know, like $6 for a rooted pad, um, which will grow a lot in its first year that you plant it. So you can get started with a lot of cacti um, very, very inexpensively. Um, and so I would encourage you to go to his website. Plus, he's got all kinds of great information on on how to grow these things. He's been growing them for years. So he's got a button, uh, where is it, right here, where he has uh, caring for the cactus. So he talks about, you know, how, you know, what I did in about a couple minutes, he does, he has a whole web page on uh, more details on this, but it's basically the same thing. Keep them dry, uh, you know, keep the soil draining and don't overdo things with them. But uh, it's, a, it's a fun website to look at. He's got some really different, plants too and you've got some some really cool winter hardy agaves there and some yuccas so um so i would encourage you really strongly to go to his website and um and uh, he's i think he's going to be shipping things now uh just a few things about uh, uh glockids uh, since we're on a punty is here uh, these are the devils these things uh, these little tiny hairs, and you, you really can't see this until you put it under a microscope. Um, but this shows why, uh, it, actually this one's upside down. But so the point of it is down at the bottom here. The point is here. So it goes in like this. And so when you're trying to pull it out, you're pulling these things into your skin. That's why they don't want to come out is because this is on the sides of every one of these things. Um, so they are brutal and you, by all means, do not want to get glockids in your skin. Um, certainly you don't want to get them in your face, you know, I, I mean, it, just anything you touch. And, and here's the thing is, even if you do use gloves, and I would encourage you to use gloves working around your cactus, um, welding gloves, welder's gloves are great. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're cumbersome but they will protect, protect you and they have really long sleeves. They'll go up to your elbows. So welders gloves, um, go get a pair of those things. They're made of leather. Um, and, uh, I haven't met a cactus that can get through a welder's glove yet. Um, 
but these things will get stuck in the leather of your welder's gloves. So even when you take those off, be careful of what you touch on your gloves, hang them somewhere, don't mess with them, don't touch them because there will be glockets on your gloves and then they'll get into your skin. So, so what if you do get them? There's, there's an incredible number of uh, uh, remedies and the webs and websites for glockets. And I don't think any of them really truly work well. I think time is what really works, but um, you, you see all kinds of things, duct tape and putting Elmer's glue on, letting it dry and then peeling it off and, you know, whatever they do for that, uh, you know, hair removal stuff. I, I bet you that would work. I don't know. That's not on the list. Whatever they call those folks. They have those shops all over Fort Collins. Um, that'd be an interesting thing to go into a store for, though, is that you've got glockets in you and you want them removed. Um, so, yeah, avoid the glockets. Um, some of the insects. So, so punnies are great. They grow really easily. They root really easy. I'll show you how to propagate them. Here's the thing is they also have some pretty common, and they can be nasty to the point where they, they'll kill your Uh One of them is the cactus bug. This is a true bug. Um, at first, they're kind of fascinating to watch. You see them out there. It's like, wow, and they're kind of cool looking, I guess, handsome if you're talking about insects. But then once you start looking at the, in, the, the damage they do. So here's Here's one of my Alpuntias, and you get these spots. So this, these are the spots where they're feeding. So true bugs, they, they have a, a, a mouthpiece. It's, it's like a hypodermic needle. So they jam that thing into the plant, and they suck juice out of it. But what they do to keep the, uh, the goodies flowing is they inject kind of an anticoagulant, something like that, something like that into, the, into the plant. And then that causes this toxic response uh, from the plant. And so you get these chlorotic yellow spots all over um, the, the pads. And if you get enough of these insects feeding, they will, they will kill the plant. They will actually kill a cactus uh, better than any kind of herbicide will. Um, you'll get all the different life stages. So, so um, uh, the true bugs, they just, they, 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 they grow from very, very tiny versions. And so here, here's the smaller uh, nymph, what we call the nymph stage of the, of the uh, adult. And you'll find these everywhere from to, to size you can barely see, because as soon as the egg hatches, you've got a, a, a potential adult. So they don't go through, you know, the metamorphosis and, and pupation and all that kind of thing. So they just keep getting larger and larger and larger. And apparently they can lay a lot of eggs because um, there are times you go out and your cactus are just so covered with bugs. You, it's kind of scary. It, you, there's just so many of them. It just weirds you out to see that many of these cactus bugs. Um, so they can kill. They absolutely can kill. Now, the true bugs are pretty easy to control. Um, so any just um, general home and garden spray, anything that you can spray, for example, for insects in your vegetable garden. So any general garden insect spray will, will kill those, um, those uh, cactus bugs. This one's a little bit tougher. Um, uh, the cochineal scale. Um, now this stuff has an interesting history in that you, you'll be able to tell this uh, when, if you get the scale on your on your cactus. And if you grow a plenty in Colorado, eventually you're gonna get um, this scale. You will absolutely eventually get it. Um, but if you squash the scale, you'll get this stain. And this is this was a, a, a source of red dye uh, for early Native Americans. They learned how to use this to dye uh, clothing. Um, and then it's got also an interesting current history of being used as a natural food dye. They got a yogurt company and a lot of negative press because they were basically using squashed up insects to dye their yogurt, uh, but doing it naturally. Um, so the Yoplait people, they don't like to talk about cochineal scale. Um, so here's the thing is you can, you can also spray for this. And I know you're gonna lose your minds 
uh, but imidacloprid, um, the neonics work pretty well on this, but, but, but wait until the plant stops blooming and there's no more pollinators coming and then you don't have to worry. So, so like at this stage, so here's a fruit. So this is well past the time of flowering for the opuntias. They form the fruit. Now you can spray uh, to control, control the scale. But if you don't, if you don't control it, eventually it will kill your plants. It may be a slow death, it may take years, but eventually they will kill the plant. The alternative is if you just have a few pads that have the scale on it, just keep, just pull those pads off as you see the infection. So I'm seeing ton, like 52 questions in the chat. So we'll stop right after this or in a, in a few slides here. Um, but here, here's just uh, the, that, that whole connection with Coach Anil. Um, and uh, there's a, there actually there's a whole book on it called A Perfect Red, um, and this this talks about uh, about this uh, you know the, the scale and it was the source of one of the very first earliest dyes. Um, um, but then uh, it talks about the yo plate uh, yogurt company was using this because yo plate wants to use all natural stuff and you don't get much more natural than a bug, right? Um, but then somehow the word got out that they were using squashed up insects to, to, to color their, their, uh, their yogurt. And the world lost its mind there for a while. And they were boycotting Yoplait, probably, you know, for cruelty to scale. Who knows? Um, but in any case, if you see any of these names on a food product, carmine, carminic acid, crimson lake, natural red four, if you see natural red four, most likely it's come from this scale. So just kind of a neat little um, trivia thing there. Here's another, this is a, this is a nasty one too, folks. Uh, this, one, this one makes you sick when you see these, these boring holes. Um, so this is a cactus borer, or also known as a cactus longhorn beetle. Um, and I would see these uh, you know, all around my house. Um, and then it's like, oh my gosh, these, this is what's killing my cactus. And they will devastate. They will absolutely destroy, destroy uh, opuntias. Um, and so what you do is uh, you start looking for the adults. And, and so if you don't want to spray anything, uh, just harvest the adults. They're big. You can see them and just squash them. And, um, but once once they're inside the plant, you've got no hope. They they bore and they they dig uh, dig throughout the inside of the plant. They just they eat the entire inside of the Europuntia and kill it. So there, this is one nasty insect. Finally, a few other things about a puntia. I'm not going to put everything in. I was going to put in. If we have time at the end, I've got some extra slides, and I don't forget. Or if you want to stay on later, I'll talk a little bit about using these as food, but uh, 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 nopalita, uh, which is simply the pads that have been uh, sliced up and cooked or canned. Um, um, and then uh, using the fruit to make a syrup or jams. Um, it'd be a kind of a cool side thing with the, uh, with the apuntias. Um, these can be pretty easy to propagate. Uh, in fact, ridiculously easy. So like the Opuntia fragilis, I said, just throw it down on gravel, it'll root. Uh, you might take a little bit more with the, with the, uh, the other Opuntias, but really not much more. Um, you can just throw them on their side. Something I forgot to mention is um, each one of these, these little, we call them aerials. Uh, so where the spines come out of this modified stem, so this is where leaves can come out, but it's also where roots can come out. So aerials on the bottom side of a pad laying on soil, you'll get roots growing out of each one of these little aerials, okay? Uh, so an easy, easy way to, to root a punny is you just lay them on soil and you'll get rooting. Uh, but usually what we see, and when you buy a punny is like from Kelly Grumman's or some of the other growers, you'll see they stick them into the ground um, vertically and then they will root. They'll send roots out from here, but they also send roots out from the aerial. So you can see on this one, 
um, the roots coming out where there were spines as well. Um, and that just shows the ability, that's where growing points are in each one of these little aerials. There's a lot of, a lot of meristemic activity there. So either way, you can stick them in the ground uh, from the tip, or and then you'll get roots this way, or you can lay them on the surface and then they'll root from the bottom of that pad. Okay, but very very easy to uh, easy to root. Here's the other interesting thing: is that the uh, uh, the fruit, the unripened fruit, and that's what these are. And so that's an unripened fruit. That's an unripened fruit. That's an unripened fruit. Um, they also have aerials on them. Um, so, uh, well, these are ripened ones. Let's see. Here we go. So here's an unripened fruit. So once that flower um, dies, um, you can break these off. And so if you've got a cactus that you really love, um, you can uh, break those fruit off and then just stick them in soil and they will root and you'll get a new plant out of that. So many different ways to propagate opuntias. Um, just one more slide, I decided to put this one in. Uh, this time of year, and for those of you who are growing up puntias especially, you know, this time of year you go out and you look at your garden and you would swear they all died. They are the ugliest looking plants you've ever seen. And you'd say, oh, they rotted over the winter. You know, my first winter after I planted these, because they did so well the first summer and it's like, oh, I lost them all. And I called my buddy in Aurora and he goes, oh, no, 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 don't worry. He says, they'll be fine. He said, just wait a few weeks and they'll be back to normal. And they do. They go from this ugly, shriveled, flat mat it, it, it's of just dead looking cactus pads. And they, they like resurrect themselves. It is, it's, it's, that in itself is cool just to watch that process. But this time of year, you'd swear they were dead. So if you do get into this, um, don't be alarmed with your first spring or after your first winter when these things look like they died and most likely they didn't. So just leave them. You'll get, you'll get a few pads always die over the winter, but just wait a while before you start wholesale pulling them up thinking that they're dead because they probably aren't. Okay. okay. L, L, do we have questions? questions. Oh, do we? oh, do we? Yes, we do, Tony. <laughs> Allison, you want to go first or? Should I look at chat? I think we have most of them, but just Carol wanted to know when the best time to plant these is, and maybe it's specific as you're going forward with examples of succulents. Yeah, well, I'm getting weird echoes. I don't know if anyone else is. So the best time to plant these. So if you go to any of the websites sometime, if you go to Kelly Grumman's, there's another one I'll show you in in Utah, uh, they start shipping these things in March. So you can really, as soon as you can uh, get a hold of them and stick them in, into, the, uh, into the ground, um, that's fine. Um, and then anytime during the summer, you know, the only thing I wouldn't do, I wouldn't buy cactus plants in like, you know, the end of August or September and then plant them hoping that they'll survive the winter. They, that, then they might have a problem surviving the winter, but certainly, you know, I mean, if you're in, if you're in uh, Grand Junction or, or Pueblo or Southeast Colorado or wherever you're joining us from and it's pretty warm, um, you know, as soon as you can get these into the ground, that's fine. So, um, I mean, do you think now would be an okay time for them to, to do that before this, <clears throat> maybe this impending? I, I, pro I probably wait a few weeks yet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here's one. Somebody, they sent their order. It was 20 below this winter. Yeah. Yeah. Keep them in your garage. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, you know, it's just like don't plant your tomatoes until mother's day kind of a thing. We tell people that and they still do it a month ahead of time. Um, you're not going to gain a whole lot by going out today and sticking your cactus in the garden. Um, so, and if anything, you might risk them for whatever reason. So um, I would say certainly April and May is gonna be a great time if you're ordering them now. Um, but yeah, June, July, August, you know, if you're gonna root things, just, just, and it's just kind of fun, just break some of those pads off 
especially if you get those uh, the fragilis. It is it is truly remarkable how well they uh, um, and how quickly they root. Uh, well, these cactus survive in the shade. Uh, you know, a punny as well because they're just so, you know, bulletproof. I wouldn't do the ball cactus or any of the other ones I'm, that I'm bringing up, like the, the Choi is now. Uh, but they're pretty much, you know, you want at least, I would say, west or south exposure um, is what I would say. You know, maybe east, maybe. You know, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. So my parents, I, I grew up in Illinois and I was a, I was a plant geek when I was like six years old and I would bring all kinds of weird stuff. And I remember um, I found a, I found a puntias growing in Illinois. They will grow in the plains of the, the Midwestern plains. Uh, one of the books I'll show you is a guy from Michigan who grows winter hardy cactus in Michigan and the, where they get, they're getting 50 inches of rain per year. So talk about needing good drainage. Um, but I put, I put the, uh, planted some, some uh, opunias at my parents' house in Chicago on the east side of their house. And we just sold that house, um, uh, their house uh, last year, about a year ago now. And those opuntia were still alive. And that was, they were well, 50 years old, easily. 50 years old, that patch of opunias growing on the east side where they're getting 40 inches of rain in the heaviest, nastiest clay soil ever. So. So yeah, I would say if you want to try something, growing something in the shade, the opuntias are going to be your best, um, your best uh, source. Kelly Grumman's is almost sold out. Well, I didn't see that last night when I was on there, but no surprise because his quality is so good. Um, are cacti hard to grow from seed? Not hard, but they're slow to grow from seed. Um, what other? Were there any common questions or ones I you guys couldn't answer? The only other question I. Think we didn't answer was our insects both an east and west slope problem or just east yes slope? no both both yeah I know that I know the uh, uh, the the the, uh, the longhorn beetle is a big problem in in uh, the west slope as well yeah and I've got them over here I've got all of them over here so yeah so I can confidently say that they're both sides. All right, I think that's it. I guess in the interest of time, we should keep on moving. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so Choyas, and I, I, you know, people often mispronounce words and names. So you hear people call them chalas and that kind of thing, but it's Choya. Um, and so these are tree-like, um, and actually these these are very closely related to Apuntias, and some people actually say they are Apuntias, uh, and that's I, I'm not gonna get into that conversation. Uh, but these will get very tall. And if you go down to Southern Colorado around Pueblo, um, in fact, there's a, a golf course down there called Walking Stick. And there are these, um, these, uh, these are all over the place down there. And they get very, they'll get, they'll get six feet tall down there. Um, so these are pretty winter hardy. Uh, mine, in my experience, the tops of mine, they, they die off uh, to, to some degree every year. And sometimes mine die off almost totally to the ground. And again, it's, I don't water them. So I think you can help prevent that with a little bit of winter watering. And it just makes sense. Anything that's sticking way up in the air like this and with the cold winds we get and more exposure to, to, to winter kill. So, you know, I show these temperatures and that's what's really it's referring to kind of the base of the plant's not going to kill off um, until you get below these temperatures, but the tops. Yeah. I don't think you even have to get below zero for some of the tops to die off over the winter. So they do have some really nasty spines. Just they're, they're, they're nasty. You don't want to be planting these by your front door or where you get a lot of traffic unless you want to keep people away. So that could work there. But, uh, um, you know, the flowers are kind of cool, but they're not, they're, in my mind, they're not the reason you plant them. You either get some some pink ones and some get some some kind of yellow flowers. Um, I don't think the flowers are that special, to be honest. Um, it's just the shape of the plant, the structure, the fact that you have this cactus that can grow, at least in my house. They'll, they'll get about three or four feet tall. That's about it. Um, I've never gotten them to get real tall. But Southern Colorado, you can see the real tall ones. Um, Here's another one. This is called Whipple's Choya. 
Um, and there's there's actually uh, varietal names for this one. One is called Snow Leopard. Uh, the, the, the pictures don't do this one justice. You want to see this one late in the afternoon um, with the sun shining, the sun setting through the spines. That's what you want. So you want to be with the sun facing the facing the, the choya and the sun and watch this, the sun come through these um, these spines. And these are like daggers. They are they are amazingly nasty, nasty spine. So you don't want to mess with these plants and they are covered with them, truly, totally covered. That's what makes them really cool is, is the, uh, um, the spines on these things. It's not the flowers. And, then, and again, they have very inconspicuous, non-showy yellow green flowers, but the, just, a, just a gorgeous kind of an accent plant. Um, just another picture of it. And they're they're just they're just so cool. Um, they're just amazing plants. So, um, but yeah, definitely nasty to work around. Um, so here's Echinocereus, um, Claire Cup Cactus. This one grows really really well in Colorado. Very winter hardy. Uh, you need good drainage. This one grows well in those um, tufa containers. Um, so, um, but yeah, so this is a nice one for containers. It'll grow and kind of drape over the edge. It spreads, um, but it, it's, it's, it's a real good one. It's an easy one to propagate. You can just break some of these kind of balls off and, um, but it gets just absolutely covered with these brilliant red um, uh, flowers. So gorgeous, gorgeous one. Uh, the little ball cacti. These things are the coolest little plants. Um, they are, they are tiny. They are winter hardy. They get so many flowers on them that you can't see the cactus for a while. Um, they're just, and they 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 look tropical. They they just have the a very tropical, almost it looks like an artificial flower. You know, so you know when you go to the store if you get fooled into those ones that have the fake flowers stuck to the top of them. They almost look like this, but this is not fake. These are the true flowers. Um, they attract some really cool pollinators. Um, and then they get some, I don't know if I have a picture here. They get some really cool little fruit. No, I don't have a picture of the fruit. They get real bright red um, uh, fruit, especially this one, this uh, sulcata. Um, it gets a bright red, like looks like a little red berry. Um, so very cool little plants. Again, here's that pedio cactus, the mountain ball cactus, and again, hardy to zone two. So, you, you know, you, you can't kill this one unless you have poor drainage. You need, you need really good drainage. This one does great in containers too. Uh, so if you want to just try growing a few containers of uh, winter hardy and this one will, it will propagate and it'll spread really quickly. Um, and uh, fill up a container so but again very cool um very cool colors on this one um hedgehog cactus another echinocereus it gets yellow green flowers and it, it has this a lemon lemony smell really cool um so and it gets tons and tons of flowers another good one for for containers if you want to do uh, container uh, cacti and you can leave them outside all year just remember, you're gonna to have to water them even during the winter, probably once a week. Oh, here's a container. So here is one container uh, showing some of the ball cactus, and um, then you can put some some semps in there and some cool looking rocks, and it'll fill up. And but yeah, you, you're still gonna to have to water this like once a week. So just don't think, well, they're cactus and they can go forever without water. Not when they're growing in these containers. But those are really good places to be growing those. Uh, here's another great one. This lace cactus, super winter hardy, um, Echinocereus, uh, really cool flowers. Um, you know, you can touch this one. It's got, looks like it has a lot of spines, but you can touch it and it's not gonna, not gonna hurt you. Um, here's one that was, uh, this was an endangered species um, and, and it still may technically be in its native um, environment and mainly because it was collected or either or grazed by animals um, to the point of extinction, uh, but it's super easy to propagate. So all all the companies that sell cactus uh, sell this one now, and so this is it's, it's kind of one of those good stories where we've rescued a plant from extinction 
by growing it in the uh, green industry. Um, really, it's just a, a really cool plant. Um, it, it spreads like crazy. So that's another good one for those hyper two foot containers. Um, it, just where you have drainage and it, it's, it's a great little container cactus. Uh, just another picture of how it spreads. Um, and it spreads quickly, really fast. You'll get a nice little pad of these things uh, very quickly. And cool little flowers. Oh, there we go. So here's the container. This shows this shows how they can grow. I took this picture at, at DBG, I believe. Um, and they've got some great containers of, uh, of cactus there. And uh, so... Oh, here's showing the, the fruit. So this is the fruit I was going to tell you about. Um, so amazing flowers, amazing flowers. And then you get these cool little fruit um, on there. And so they give you color for the whole rest of the year after the flowers form. So um, this is another, another good one, good one for containers, but also good one to plant in the ground. Just need really, really good drainage. Otherwise, you're going to kill it. Um, you know, yuccas can go well in your winter hardy uh, garden. And you know, so we've got a plant select one, this Texas red yucca. Um, that's a, just a cool plant. Um, and then there's these, uh, a couple of different other species, uh, dwarf yuccas, and these are just cool plants. They stay really, really small. Um, they get this really amazing um, growth form. They look like little balls with with uh, uh, just points coming out, kind of like a hedgehog that's curled up. Um, and then they get all these little uh, tendrils um, that it just, it's parts of the, the uh, leaves that, that peel off. And so it looks like it needs a haircut or a head a hair trim, um, but that's what gives it its, uh, its uh, uh, character. So uh, again, both very, very winter hardy. And again, uh, I know Kelly Grumman sells those. Um, and then uh, the, the winter hardy agaves. Uh, for me, these have been borderline. Um, I had them survive for quite a number of years and I lost them all one year when it got really, really cold. Um, and then when they flower, they die, which is, it's a cool thing to see them flower. And then it's a depressing thing to see them flower because you know this enormous plant that you've had for years is gonna die. So, but they will produce pups, um, side shoots. So you're always gonna have extra ones. Okay, so where do you get these? Where do you buy these? So here, so I told you about Kelly Grumman's uh, place, but here's another really cool one um, uh, called Intermountain Cactus. And uh, they've got an amazing selection. Um, they've already got their 2021 price list down and they're, they're actually starting to ship already. So that's a, that's a very cool um, uh, place. Um, here's another one out of Idaho called Geoscape Nursery. And um, they've got a lot of plants and you can see they're, 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 uh, they're selling again in March. So, um, so you're getting into the, the time of year. And I would say just like all the other plants in the green industry, maybe this one's not on the radar, most new home gardeners, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been hard to buy a lot of plants because uh, everybody's putting gardens in. I doubt that the winter hardy cactus gardens are on the radar of most people, but uh, as, you, as someone noted, Kelly Grumman's has sold out of a lot of his stuff already. So there are people buying this stuff. So get your orders in early or find somebody that has stuff that can give you some pads to propagate. Uh, some good books on, uh, on growing these. Um, uh, uh, Gwen Caladis uh, ha, ha, wrote this book. It's, it's uh, what, about 12 years old now, but you can, get this one. It's not just on winter hardy cactus. She talks about a bunch of other um, uh, perennial garden perennials that are um, uh, hardy here in Colorado uh, for our for our conditions. Um, here's a really good book on um, uh, cacti for for uh, cold climates. And this guy's from Colorado Springs. So um, so he's he's about as local as you can get. And this is a this is a really good book uh, for what kind of plants to to stick in the ground. Here's another great book. And I never had this and I just bought it um, really a couple months ago. And it, this thing is so cool. Um, so it talks about the cactus of Colorado. So, uh, but if you're into hiking and it, it's just, it tells where you go in the state 
to find all of these on, um, um, on uh, uh, protected lands, places you can find them growing um, um, in the wild, um, and then where to uh, find uh, ones that you can buy and plant in your own garden. So a, a tremendous, tremendous local resource, just, just super pictures great pictures and maps and uh this is just it's just really a very very good book so i would encourage you to get that if you have any interest at all in this um here's the one from the guy in, in michigan um this one's a little harder to find um, um i had to buy mine used on amazon but i just saw that they had some some new ones on amazon but this fellow is growing these winter hardy cactus in michigan so if he can grow them there where it's that wet if you've got a drainage problem um i would probably start looking at, at this book to see uh, what plants he's had success with. Um, I would encourage you to, if you want more information, go to the Colorado Cactus and Succulent Society website. Um, they talk about plant sales there, which have been stifled a bit in the past, but you, that, this is a place to, uh, to get some really cool plant material. Um, you know, DBG also has a, 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 a plant, a cactus sale. And I, I think I forgot to put this in here. Um, so check Denver Botanic Gardens website for their cactus uh, uh, sale. And that's where I got some really cool stuff for my, for my garden in past years. Um, if you want to, if you're really into Opuntias, um, here's a website dedicated to Opuntias. And I just stuck this in because I love this thing up here. Glockids are forever is their, their tagline, which does tell you a little bit about how long they stick around in your skin. But um, but it's a really cool website um, and lots of great information and pictures, um, just talking about Apuntias and um, you, know, you can see over 90 species are native to North America. So it's, that's a really kind of a cool thing. Um, so there are some people that's all they plant in their gardens are Apuntias. They just kind of specialize in those. And finally in the West Slope, um, the Chinle Cactus and the Succulent Society, this is an incredible website. There's so many good articles on this website. Um, and in fact, I, I think I have a web, uh, I took this screenshot last night. Look at this, growing winter hardy cacti and other succulents outdoors in Western Colorado, right there. Um, so this is a, a really, I think it's like a six page article. So if you're still not tired of it after listening to me or you wanna do some more reading, go to their website. Um, read this guy's article. It's really good. It's super, a super good article. Um, but just that whole website is amazing. And again, they've got calendar of when they're having um, workshops and, and uh, uh, sales and that kind of thing. And if you've never been over to the, that cactus garden in, uh, in Grand Junction, uh, you want to go over and, uh, and see that it's pretty spectacular. And the master gardeners over there uh, help care for that garden. So amazing amazing place so um so that's all i have um what other questions do we have the chat went wild tony so <laughs> okay good <laughs> we're Let's not really see. sure <laughs> if we answered everything or not so i would say if we didn't answer your question um you might want to pop it back in there real quick yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's somebody lost. Oh, oh, Janine lost her agave. Yeah. That's when I lost mine, Janine. Same time. Could you address any sort of animal issues these plants have? So deer, elk, uh, and then I think rodents can be an issue. So if you could just address that. Yes. The warm yeah. So this, this, these can be a major source of nutrition for like voles and meadow mice and other critters depending on how far out into the the hinterland you live like where i live um you know the spines to some degree will give some protection but when animals are hungry it's like pretty incredible like what deer and elk will feed on so yeah um so i've seen signs of uh, some kind of rodent feeding on mine. I don't know if it's voles or mice. Um, I would expect that maybe ground squirrels would feed on these things if they were hungry enough or looking for water because they're going to be a source of water too, especially over the winter. Um, I don't see problems 
with mine in the summer with with any animals. It's it's mainly over the winter when they're animals looking for they're desperate for something to eat. So um, and certainly cattle, cattle, if cattle get to your garden and that's happened to me a few times, um, they will they'll feed on them. Um, because it's there, they seem to be oblivious to spines and all that kind of stuff. Tony, is there any other uh, treatment for cactus borers besides removing the adults before they bore in? Yeah, nothing that I'm aware of. Um, now, I would check um, uh, the Grand Jung, the, the West Slope Cactus Society. They, they have much more experience with the insect over there, I think. And so maybe some of their folks have found something. Um, I should ask Whitney what his opinion of that would be. I know he has, doesn't have a lot of experience with it, um, but um, I have not found any, certainly labeled um, from a university perspective, um, insecticide applications that are effective. So, so yeah, for now, it's like you see him squash him just to keep him from laying the eggs. Can you talk yeah. about your favorite tips on weeding? I told someone to get a very long pair of tongs and wear their gloves. <laughs> yeah, barbecue tongs. The real long barbecue tongs are good. Um, you know, the nice thing about the gravel, so, so the gravel, um, when stuff like, oh, like foxtail, the, the annual grasses come in, you can literally, <laughs> it, 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 or those grasses root into the gravel, they don't root into the soil below if you have a thick enough gravel there, and it's so easy to pull them out. Um, it's just when you get like quack grass or something, brome grass, I get brome grass in mine. And I'll be honest, I, I just spray Roundup, and I'm not really that careful about it, and I have never killed a cactus with Roundup. I, no, I'm no. not recommending you do that. I'm not, don't, so don't, don't do it and then yell at me if your cactus dies from it. I'm just telling you. But I think if you do the, the, the kind of the wiping, if you get, just get some Roundup on some a paper towel, wear a glove, wear a, a rubber glove, and then wipe like brome grass, if you get brome or quack grass growing in there, and just wipe those leaves. And that'll, it'll translocate down and, and, and kill those, those grasses growing. Uh, you could, you, you know, I would, I, I don't know if I would use grass be gone because these opunias are closer to botanically to grasses than they are to some of the other things that'll tolerate grass be gone. And I hate to recommend that. And I, it's not on the label. Cactus is not on the label for, for, uh, for grass be gone. So I would not, or if you want to try it, try it and then let us know. But um, I have not tried. Yeah, pitchforks. Yeah. What about but, bindweed? Uh, bindweed, I would just, I would wipe it with Roundup or just keep pulling it. Again, you, those of you have heard me talk about bindweed. If you pull it enough times, it gives up. It really does, folks. Uh, so just keep after it and it will. And that's what I do with mine. I just keep pulling it. And eventually, it's just, you wear it out. It just stops growing back. So, and it will. Just don't let it go to seed because it will go to seed in your cactus and then in, in your gravel, then you'll find, you'll find the little bindweed plants growing all over the place. So do not let it flower. That's the key. Any others? There is, there's a, a longer one from uh, Katie. If you want to check the chat, Tony, it might be easier for you to read through it. Um, but it's about amending the soil and how much. Yeah. So yeah, that's Kelly Grumman's. So Kelly likes to amend the soil with sand. I see, see what bothers me is it's 30 to 40 percent. Um, I would add more like 80 to 90 if you're going to do it. Um, otherwise, I think that's not enough sand unless. So here's the thing. And he's not real specific at his website. That's the thing. If you're just amending the planting hole. Of this of the cactus, that might be enough sand. But I, I would, if I was going to do it, I would just put more. I wouldn't do 30 to 40. I'd make it like 80 to 90. So that's, I, I would, that's the only thing. But I mean, he's been doing it forever. So, you know, who am I to argue with Kelly Grummans? Although I don't so, like dog tough grass, but that's a different story. Um, yeah. Um, 
I have a personal question about this too. I've, I've heard of people using expanded shale to break yeah. up clay. Is that, what do you think about that? I think it's the same thing. I think if you're going to do it, do a lot of it. Okay. Yeah. Do it like 80, 90, you know, then, then there's still enough clay. There's more than enough clay to give you water holding and nutrient holding capacity. If you're at 80 or 90% shale or sand. Yeah. And some people, they just do gravel. Like, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember our master gardener that moved to the West Slope, Al. Um, Nancy. She, Nancy. Nancy Hilbrecht. She liked doing gravel and sand and all that. And she didn't do a lot of it, but she said it worked for her. So, so we would have debates on how much. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to say Kelly Grummons is wrong. He's been doing it, obviously here longer than I have. He grew up here and has been doing it for 40 years or probably 50 now. So and I, I like the squeegee, which is what you see in the picture there. It's yes. like, it's more of a smaller crushed. It's yeah. much yeah. smaller than pea gravel. I like that. Yes. Stuff. Yeah. I like squeegee. I get, I get the, the unicolor squeegee, uh, the multicolor squeegee is cheaper. I like the, the red chip. I, I try them all. So I, I, you know, I've got all kinds of colors in mind. So, yeah. I think the yes. lesson with cacti gardening is that it's going to be trial and error, just like anything else you plant in Colorado and find what works for you and go with that. Right. Yeah. Start, start with, start with the fragilis and the, the opuntias. They're pretty bulletproof. The ball cactus are a little, they're just a little trickier and they're more expensive and they make you, you feel bad when you, when you lose them because they're so cute. Um, but they knew they need really good drainage. Uh, with the ball cactus. So start with the Apunias. They're more forgiving, I think. Thank you so much, Tony. And again, for those of you still on, we will email the recording and links and handouts available to you uh, with your email address. So thanks so much.